Hello, everyone. My name is Gibson Biddle, and I'm super excited to share with you my talk, Inventing the Future is Hard, at ProductCon Online. I'd love you to sit back and relax. Uh, I've put a PDF at this link for you already, so you don't have to be scrambling and writing notes the whole time. In my talk, I'm really going to talk about three things, three chapters, if you will. First, I'm going to talk about Mars. And then I'm going to apply some of these theories and ideas to a product that I hope you know and love, which is Netflix. And then I'm going to close it out by talking about your rocket ship, whatever company com or startup you're with today. So Mars, I want you to imagine that you just showed up at a new job and your new job is a very hard one. It is to colonize Mars, to put humans on Mars so, so that they can learn and grow there. A tough job, I, I've borrowed a screen from Away, which is uh, about the exploration of Mars on Netflix. And just to give you a sense of how hard this job is, uh, I just asked about a hundred folks, hey, what year will the first human land on Mars? And I want you to think about that question for a moment. And then I'm gonna share with you the response to show you the diversity of thinking. So make a guess. And here's the response. Very, you know, most people think it's gonna be later than 2445. There's 2% that say we'll never put humans on Mars. But my point here is it's a hard job with a real diversity of thinking and expectation. Now, uh, it is true that Elon Musk says that, that he's going to do it via SpaceX in about six years. Um, and, and so he's very aggressive in his vision of the future. And then the next thing about your job as a product manager, just again, to illustrate how darn hard it is, what do you think will be your greatest challenge? Will it be the launching and landing on Mars, returning from Mars, food, water, and oxygen? living in low gravity, low pressure conditions, or funding and developing the finances to make all of this stuff happen. And again, I, I asked a, a lot of folks this question and here is the response. Most think, well, we can handle launching and landing, which is a leap of faith, you know, the getting back. And, and, and some folks will make question if your job is to colonize more, how important is it to bring people back? And again, a huge diversity of thinking. So imagine that you're the product leader and your job is to colonize Mars. Your job is to help provide a vision that makes folks understand that this is all possible and some sense of how that might work. Uh, a lot of my knowledge of Mars is, is, is from the Martian film. I'm sure yours as well. Uh, I want you to think back to that scene where, where Matt Damon has landed, uh, there's a crash. His team has all returned to Earth, and, and there he is, stuck. Uh, and, and, and then he has this huge explosion. So now he's left with nothing. He says, I've got to grow four years of food on a planet that doesn't have soil. And his response is, I'm going to science the shit out of this. And that's part of the approach for making something like this to happen. So for me, inventing the future is really about bringing these three forces to get together. It's your job as a product leader to make great decisions about people, product, and the business. And over time, you're trying to get some overlap of three, these three circles. The first is consumer science. That's really about experimentation to discover what will work and what not. And then the second force that I think about is strategy plan. And I'll share a very simple model that I use to, to create a product vision. And then the third, is developing a culture where all employees within the building have great judgment about people, product, and business. And I have found that aligning these three forces over time is what helps people to collectively invent the future together. But it's full of uncertainty. Um, I will give you a sense of, of if I were, if this were my job, here's my fuzzy vision, my product vision, if you will, for Mars. And I construct it using a very specific model. Your first step is to get big on reusable rockets. If you can launch products where they go back and forth, they can be reused. Getting out of Earth's orbit is a really hard thing. And you can see that SpaceX has been doing this. And then the second step of this journey, and this is after multiple years, is to lead in orbit refueling. Imagine, if you will, that you could get a spaceship out of Earth, but now you could essentially refuel it. The, 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 
the fuel required to get out of orbit to Mars after you've gotten out of the Earth's orbit is a lot easier. And then the third step on this journey would be to expand into Mars-based transport and supply partnerships. You can't do this alone. And my guess is this is how SpaceX will handle this next thing. They will work with others to develop the, the food, the oxygen, and multiple systems to get lots of people back and forth between the two planets. And the last is they will expand further via space construction consortium. They'll, they'll essentially create construction companies on, on Mars with lots of different companies. Now, if you notice carefully, these, these four steps of, of the journey, and they're discrete, I think of them as multiple booster rockets that, that will help you get from one step to, step to the next. And in this case, they spell GLEE, G-L-E-E. -E. And I'll share how I use this product vision uh, construction at Netflix in a moment. Now, why am I focused on Mars? Because it's really hard. It's, it's not hard to understand that this is a huge challenge, multiple years, a real diversity of vision on how it will happen. But inventing the future requires, first, this fuzzy vision, this idea that will join people in thinking, hmm, that might be possible. The second is you need a long-term strategy or a plan. And the third is you have to be willing to engage in constant experimentation. None of these steps are easier. You won't know with certainty how to do it, but you'll get focus on, on whatever stage of the question or problem you're focused on. And the last is you need a culture of iconoclast. And inventing the future, it's probably not gonna be ideas from old people like me. It's gonna be folks that are younger in their career that are always challenging and asking why, why, why? If you wanna understand what iconoclasts are, just have a 13, 14, or 15 year old son or daughter that are always questioning and challenging. And this is an important cultural component for inventing the future. My name is Gibson Biddle. Uh, I started early in my career at Electronic Arts. I was at Netflix from starting in 2005. And then I went to Chegg, a textbook rental and homework help startup in 2005, went public in 2013. And then I've been teaching the last five years, which is great fun for me. So I want to talk about Netflix in, in, in regards to some of these ideas that I've been talking about. And the initial vision, this is uh, Mark Randolph and Reed Hastings, the initial vision that they had, and this is back in 97, 98, and this isn't during an era when the DVD player had just been born. They said, it's Netflix, not DVD flicks. And their point was there would be something coming along later. And their initial vision was that they would launch downloading in the year 2000. Now, it's hard to predict the future. It turned out Netflix, we launched streaming in 2007, quite a bit later. We were waiting for internet bandwidth to develop and for us to have enough resources to actually afford content. So when I joined Netflix, I crafted this product vision and the, set, the first thing I said is based on DVD players, we're gonna get big on DVDs. And that happened. And then the next step of this rocket ship journey with these multiple booster rockets, we said we were gonna lead streaming. And then once we were an international uh, a digital service, it would be substantially easier to expand worldwide. And then a, a, another step that you can all see. Now I will tell you in good conscience, we, we, we didn't, have this idea back in 2005 about the importance of original content. But over time with experimentation, this became super clear that this was the next booster rocket. And for me as a product leader, I always want to know this next step uh, five or 10 years to help provide a common vision for everyone in the company. But again, you can see this is spelling glee. And that was the initial product vision. And the key thing here is every successful company rides the growth wave until it crests and falls. The secret is to create the next growth wave before the first one collapses. Now, this is Jeff Kagan. He was a financial analyst for Yahoo. And Yahoo is a cautionary tale. They, they got big at one thing, which was search, but they never had a follow on app. And this Glee model, this way to craft a product vision is always pushing product leaders to think what's next, what's next, what's next which is really critical when you're inventing the future. I use this Glee model 
because long-term thinking makes all things possible. And again, I've got a, a, an image from away. It's a really neat series. And in fact, it, this is all worked out for Netflix. In 1997, the first DVD by mail went out and that was the beginning of that DVD era. And in January of 2007, we launched streaming with uh, 300 stinky sort of steamy romance titles. They were really quite bad. Everything sucks at the beginning. By 2015, Netflix was in 190 countries in 40 languages and that got that broad expansion internationally. And then in 2020, Netflix won 21 Emmys. An Emmy is an award for the best TV series. At this point, Netflix was able to out HBO, HBO. Before this, HBO was the clear leader in original content. But it's just mind blowing to think that a punk DVD by mail startup could grow to, to launch digitally around the world and then eventually become a leader in original content. And this happened because of this multi-part product vision. Now, it, it was messy and it was dirty. And that's the way all of this goes. So I wanna show you what it really looked like. That's the DVD by mail beginning for Netflix and this twisted path. And then the company almost died until it invented this idea of an all you can eat subscription, a DVD subscription. And that's what it is today for 16, 17, 18 bucks. Everybody's watching as much as they want in a month. Now we got ahead of ourselves. We were a DVD by mail company. We tr tried to launch a DVD by mail service in the UK. And one week before launch, we canceled it because we realized we'd gotten ahead of ourselves. Again, messy, dirty. And we thought that something called Red Envelope Studios, which was really original content in the DVD era, uh, era, was a good idea. It turned out it failed. We killed it. That hypothesis was a failure. And then finally, we launched downloading January 2007. The word streaming did not exist at that moment in time. Customers thought you were saying streamlining, which sounded bad. And then Netflix for the first time was a streaming only service in Canada. And that was in 2010. And it was a very messy and dirty launch. The head of PR for Netflix was let go from the company because he had hired actors to, to look as though they were happy customers. Netflix had, there was a theory that a more entertaining product would, would improve retention. Max on the PlayStation, he was like your video host. He would help you to find a movie. That was a huge, failure. And then finally, House of Cards 2012, 2013 happened. And now original content's a good thing. And some in the US may remember Quickster. The company tried to shed its DVD by mail service to, to, to leave behind the booster rocket, if you will. Uh, and, and there was a user revolt and they lost 800,000 customers in the course of a quarter. Uh, and they took their market cap from 40 billion down to 10 billion. Really messy, really dirty. And then in fact, House of Cards was killed around 2017, 2018, when Kevin Spacey was implicated in sexual harassment. By the by, that decision was a 20 minute decision made by one person who was, at, who was adhering to the culture of inclusion, the value of inclusion at Netflix, shows you how people can make great decisions without even talking to each other because of a focus on culture. And then as I said, you know, the story ends well, uh, last year, Netflix had 160 Emmy nominations and 20 wins. So that's what the, the, the future really looks like. It's messy and dirty. And here is Netflix multi-stage rocket, these four steps. And one of the things I want you thinking about is, huh, what's next? Because as a product leader, you always want to know what that next wave is. The Glee model, G-L-E-E, -E, can expand forever. Uh, in fact, needs to expand if you want to build one of these great companies that stands the test of time, 50 or 100 years. So I want to share with you, you know, I've given you a sense of a, a, the product vision and a bit of a plan, but I want to share the, the product strategy. And through a bunch of series of experiments, we discovered that these ideas were really important. And all of these ideas helped to answer the question, how will we delight customers and hard to copy margin enhancing ways. And there were really four or five key ideas. The first, we set out to build a simple and easy experience. Uh, and and it, in the old days, it was very complicated, but every time we made it simpler, it got better. We learned in the long-term how important personalization is. 
Now think about it. Today, Netflix knows the member taste of 200 million people throughout the world. This is unique technology that's very hard to copy. And in fact, it actually helps to build the business as well. And we learned in the DVD era how important it was to get a disc to you next day in the mail. And of course, in the streaming area, click the button, you're just watching. You don't have to download stuff. You don't have to set up stuff to make it work. It's really remarkable. And the last idea is we set up a, a device ecosystem. We created a hard to copy network effect that every screen in the world was magically pre-wired so you could watch Netflix instantly, anytime, anywhere. And that is a very hard to copy network effect. So these were five ideas that consistently worked over multi-booster from DVD to streaming to international to original content. So I've given you enough context and I've got two little quizzes for you. I want you to imagine you're the product leader at Netflix at two critical moments in time. I've articulated the long-term product vision. I articulate these, these five ideas that are important for the product strategy. And I, I want you to pretend that you're the product leader and you have to make choices about what to do. And this first step, this is stage one of the rocket, DVD by mail in 2005. And you have a growing DVD by mail library. It's like 50,000. You're trying to get it to maybe 100,000 available on the platform. At the time, it cost $22 a month to have three DVDs to choose from sitting on top of your DVD player. And at this point, Blockbuster it had copied Netflix's survey, service. And then it did something else called total access. And it meant you could get a DVD from them in the mail, but then you could swap it instantly in their store. It was really, I mean, at this point, Netflix is one or two million subscribers. It's a really, it's still a punk startup. And every month, 5% of our customers would cancel the service. Now that was better than it was at startup where it was 10%. But the key point is 5% cancel. And that's really bad for business. And you need to make retention better. That's really your proxy metric as the product leader is to make this cancel rate smaller and smaller. And the company had never demonstrated a profit. So this is the, the moment in time. Now, Netflix is a bit of an idea factory and you've got lots of people advocating different ideas at this moment in time to help with the company. So here are the ideas and what I'd like you to think about, which two, maybe three ideas would you focus on here if you were the product leader at the, the moment in time? This was my job. Which of these ideas do you think are most important given the long-term product vision and given the product strategy in order to improve retention, to make it 5% canceled, to get it to maybe only 4% canceled? Now, again, I've asked this idea of lots of different folks, and I want to share what the collective wisdom is. So you can see a lot of people informed by the strategy say, wow, it's really important to get DVD by mail fast. We know instance is important. And then personalization must be important. And then there's a third idea at the bottom, which is let's launch social. Let's make it so people can get great movie ideas from your friends. So I, I want to share what we actually learned through experimentation. So yes, that speed up DVD is a great idea. Launching lower price plans was really important and helpful. Yes, we committed to the long-term idea of personalization, but it took 10 years before we could prove that it improved retention. And we actually launched both ads and used DVD sales. And that was the thing for the first time that helped us to make money. And money is like rocket fuel for startups. We did launch original content in the DVD era. And as I told you, it failed then, but then succeeded about 10 years later. And we launched social, and it turns out in the context of movies, I, movie ideas from your friends are, aren't helpful. Your friends' movie tastes suck, okay? And you don't want them to know what exactly you were watching, that I was binge watching Cake Boss last night, for instance. So this just gives you a sense of how hard it is. Frankly, the experimentation is to figure out what works and what doesn't. And what I'm hoping to learn from this exercise is at through this journey, we were beginning to understand what was really core um, to what we did as a company. And it was all about a big selection. It was all about value, getting a lower price, giving you a lot of stuff, not everything you wanted, but at a price that made sense. And the importance of next day demands. We went from 20 hubs in the US to 100 hubs. And at some point, 
about 85% of our discs were delivered the next day in the mail, which really helped build value. We made the long-term bet on personalization. We just committed to it. And you know, after 10 years, we finally discovered it worked. And just this model of, hey, our job is to delight customers in hard to copy margin enhancing ways, got enough focus on delighting an obsession of customer, but also created this hard to copy advantage that made it so over time, we didn't have to worry about competition. And then margin equals fuel, this profit, we were able to invest the profit from advertising and DVD by mail in, in making our service better. And then the last, consumer science is hard. Most of you thought that social uh, in the context of movies was a good idea. It certainly was good with Facebook and Spotify and others. It just tells you how hard this experimentation process is. All right, so I have a second to illustration. I'm gonna take you two years further forward into streaming in 2007. We've just launched Watch Instantly. And that's what we called it. Customers understood what that meant. And about 5% of our customers watched at least 15 minutes in a month. In fact, it was Brent Avery who was the product manager for this. This was his job to increase the percentage of customers who watched at least 15 minutes a month. That was a proxy metric. And the idea is if we could drive that up into the right, in the long term, we would improve retention. We had about 300 stinky, steamy romance titles available. And it was only available on a PC, on a laptop, not a Mac. You had to download this horrible software to, from, it was called Silverlight from Microsoft to make it work. So your job, your Brent Avery, your job is to improve that proxy metric. And again, Netflix is a bit of an idea factory. Which two or three of these ideas would you focus on to improve that proxy metric, to move it up to the right? So in the long term, you likely improve binge watching. So lots of ideas here. And I'll share with you the collective wisdom. I just asked about 100 product leaders around the world, what do you think? And they committed to the personalization. And they committed to getting Netflix engaged in creating hardware so that you could watch where customers want it, which is on the TV. They committed the idea to build a magic box that would pioneer this idea. And they committed to 1,000 titles for stars. Those are the top three. So I wanna share what we learned. First, we got within a month of launching our own Netflix player. And we realized we couldn't do it because it would put us in the hardware business. And if we did that, people would be wary about connecting to our platform because we'd have an inside advantage. So a month within launch, we threw a hundred engineers out of the building and that became the, the startup story of Roku, one of the first players. We did launch on the Mac and that was a good idea. And I'm sure many were thinking mobile devices was a good idea, but it wasn't. It wasn't important until about 2012, 2013, these small screens. We got lucky. We signed a Stars deal for a thousand titles. That was huge and important. And then yes, we invented binge watching. That was a happy accident. And then yes, we, we stayed focused on personalization. And what I'm hoping that you'll learn from this exercise is that um, and one of the things that we learned was we were creating a streaming platform, but we weren't trying to become a hardware company. The important thing was to create that network effect was by partnering with people all over the world. The next thing was the continued investment in personalization. And then it was unanticipated. You know, frankly, we invented binge watching because we were looking for anything to make our customers' lives better. And that was almost like a happy accident, if you will. And then we did have, for the first time, original content success. House of Cards was an excellent example of that. And as I said, uh, you can't predict everything. Um, sometimes the rocket is you know, on its way to Mars. And you, you know, on the way, you got to figure out how to land the damn thing. And that happens a lot. And that's really part of the journey of entrepreneurship. This is Reid Hoffman. Um, he's the co-founder of LinkedIn. But he was a great angel investor. An entrepreneur is someone who will jump off a cliff and assemble an airplane on the way down. And that's what you find yourself doing. That's why entrepreneurship feels so hard at times. So I just wanna quickly tell you how the, the multi-booster rocket phases work for Netflix. International, it's clear that the company expanded well. Today, they're everywhere but China, Crimea, Syria, and um, North Korea. Um, so 
you know, huge. And then stage four, the original content, if you're a Netflix member, I, I hope you appreciate Stranger Things or Dark or Orange is the New Black or Money Heist, or this is really uh, interesting, Making a Murderer, Netflix married documentary with episodic TV content. You know, this is really a new invention. Uh, or just, I don't even know what to call this kind of thing, but here's David Letterman who had uh, Barack Obama or the Kardashian, uh, which is amazing. And then recently the big hits, who would have thunk something like Selling Sunset about selling real estate in the LA County or a huge international hit all over the world. Netflix is creating content from all over the world and sharing it with people all over the world. Um, but here's Indian matchmaking. And of course they had failures along the way too. This is Chelsea Handler. They experimented with something that felt sort of like live TV. Uh, that she would, every night she'd get on and within two hours, her, her TV uh, show would be translated into 40 languages. And it was a failure. So of course, you know, this experimentation uh, leads to success and failure. Not everything that Netflix did in original content worked out. So here's the question I wanna pose for you. I talked to you earlier about the importance of always knowing what's next. And Netflix has been on this multi-stage rocket journey from DVDs to streaming to international to original content. But as a product leader of Netflix today, you wanna to be able to answer the question, what's next? So I want you thinking, what do you think would be important five or 10 years out that will force everybody to keep innovating, to keep getting better? And that's really a, a key thing. And this is uh, Sam Altman. He's the chairman of Y Combinator. They've launched startups like um, Airbnb, huge companies. His coaching here is be more ambitious. Then talk about that big vision and work relentlessly towards it but always have a next step. So my question for you today is what should the next step for Netflix be? That's what I will put to you. And again, I, I put this out to hundred product leaders around the, the world and, and here was their answer and it's built a word cloud. So lots of folks saying, huh, I think virtual reality or gaming or VR games or pay-per-view or interactive movies, these are all ideas. And, and your job as a product leader is to think, okay, what's consistent with our product strategy that will help the company propel it way, its way towards Mars over the next five to 10 years. So I'm gonna tell you what my hypothesis is. And this is really the way these stages work out. My hypothesis is that the next stage of Netflix's growth will in fact be interactive stories. So if you've looked carefully, this is the incredible Kimmy Schmidt um, you're able to, in, in the scene, decide, help Kimmy decide whether she's going to make out or to plan the wedding. And, and I, the reason I'm an advocate of interactive stories, I think it has the potential to delight customers in hard to copy, margin enhancing ways. The delight, the way that, that they're measuring this today is, my guess is it's, it's the, what percentage of customers watch at least an hour in a month. And my guess is that's about 1%. And if they could drive that to 10% over the next five or 10 years, that will make a huge difference. What's hard to copy about this? That the tools that you need to create to create this, create this almost uh, ecosystem with all the studios. Imagine that all the studios only wanna work with Netflix and, and giving them the tools to build these kinds of things. And the way you improve margin, if you can drive today, 2% uh, of Netflix customers cancel every month, if you could uh, move your proxy metric to light up to the right, that this is the way that you might drive to retention to only one and a half percent cancel each month. And that's really good for the business. And, and Netflix knows that it's really competing for screen time. It's not competing with HBO or Disney or Hulu. It's competing for your attention on these tiny little devices. You know, should I get on Instagram or should I be using Fortnite? Uh, and that's why I think that they're interested in, in interactive stories. There's lots of experiments out there. If you have a kid, you've seen DreamWorks Puss and Book where you help decide where the story goes or my favorite Captain Underpants epic choice, Orama. Or if you're a grown up like me, Black Mirror's Bandersnatch, you decide what the character is going to do. Of course, they, they, they won, uh, I think this is an Emmy award for that, which is exciting. 
And of course, I talked about the incredible Kimmy Schmidt. So I want to marry a couple ideas here as I, as I finish things out. I've shown Netflix's five stages, the DVDs, streaming, international, original, and here's my hypothesis of in interactive content. But I want you to notice along the way, Netflix has learned through the experimentation, what's important, what's created value for both customers and the business. And at every stage in this journey, it's been almost equal part success and failure. So I shared the successes during each of these phases. And I want you to recognize that about half of the ideas that they tried were failures. But each of these, these wins and losses help you to understand how to build the core value for a customer. So today, Netflix is engaged in the beginning of experimentation, what will work and what will not in interactive stories. And we'll see if that becomes important five or 10 years out. And then the other thing I wanna marry here is imagine that your job as a product leader and you're trying to figure out how much to invest in each of these areas, each of these booster rockets at any moment in time. In 2010, the investment was 20% in DVDs across the company, 30% in streaming, 40% in international, and only 10% in originals. That was kind of the experiment at the time. And today, you know, if I were the product leader, I'm guessing this is what the investment would look like at Netflix about 5% in DVDs, you know, it's almost dead. There's a few people in the, in the US that are still doing that. 30% in streaming, it's still critically important. 30% in, in helping to, to get stories from all around the world brought to every country in the world. 30% in original content, because we can see how important that is today, but only 5% in this interactive stories. But this is an early experiment. And if it doesn't work, they'll move on to the next hypothesis about what's next for Netflix. So I wanna bring things home for you. I just want you to be thinking just for a moment about your rocket ship, your current company, your current job. And I want you thinking about bringing these three ideas together. The first is have a strategy, that's the plan. Think about how this long-term vision tool, the Glee model can help you describe what's next. Think about where is your company investing today in these multi-stages investment? And I always want you to be thinking and answering the question about what's the strategy? How do I delight customers in these hard to copy margin enhancing ways? And I, I want you to, to, to share things like my hypothesis is that, um, that uh, original content will, will help our company. If you're at Spotify, that would probably be a good hypothesis. The next thing is to, to understand that this is all about experimentation. I call that consumer science. To, to trying to give the answer to what works and what doesn't. And be maniacally focused on your customers. I call that customer obsession to discover what delights them. Commit to fast-paced experimentation. Always be learning about what makes the core of your product better. And always begin to experiment with the ideas that will lead to the next step, the next step function of your multi-stage booster rocket. Today, I'm hoping that's interactive stories for Netflix. And then along the way, I want you to be aware of how important culture is because culture describes the values of a company and they, they actually describe the skills and behaviors that are wanted by needed by everybody in the building. And two of the most critical values for me in inventing the future, and you can look at the Netflix culture, you'll see it's all about curiosity, you know, trying to understand what's next. Will this work? Will this not work? And then having the courage to commit to sometimes crazy ideas. Think about what Elon Musk is doing with SpaceX as he's trying to make us a multi-planetary race, okay? And then recognize that each stage of the company, you might need different kinds of people. Netflix, you know, was a DVD by mail company, but today, about you know, more than half of the talent in the building is all about picking great content. These are radically different people. And then the last idea is to commit to this idea of iconoclast. Recognize that what got you there to, to this point in time won't necessarily get you the rest of the journey. So be open to exploring new ideas and asking why, 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 or actually challenging ideas to say, this is the stupidest idea I've ever heard. And that's what helps you to create a culture of iconoclast. So I'm just gonna bring it home with just, there's one last thing required. This is Reed Hastings. He's the co-CEO of Netflix. Uh, Ted Sarandos is the other co-CEO. This is the tech guy and Ted's the content guy. 
And there's one last thing required, and that is patience. It takes a long time to build a great company. This is the market cap of Netflix over time. You can see, you know, it, today's value was hardly worth anything in 2005. And then you can see it took almost 20 years to create incredible value. The market cap is probably close to 300 billion today. It just takes a lot of time to figure this stuff out. So with that, I will say thank you. It's been great fun to be at Product Con today. This is one of my favorites. If you haven't watched, it's the Queen's Gambit or watch Magnus on Amazon. It's a, it's a real life documentary. Um, just one last thing. I wanna share with you my consumer science. Sometimes I feel like I'm breathing fire. Uh, I'm a street performer doing my thing. And this is that incredibly awkward moment where I'm passing the hat, but I'm not asking you for your money. I'm asking you for feedback. So if you hold up your phone right now, um, using your camera app, I'm doing it. I, um, a link has magically popped up for Servant Monkey, And it's asking a simple question on a scale of zero to 10, where zero sucks and 10 is great. How likely would you be to recommend this talk to a, a friend or a colleague? I would feedback. It's incredibly helpful to me. And this is how I learned to do talks. And then it asks you one other question. What's one thing that was good about this talk? And, and another, what would make it better? I now have 650 uh, different surveys and that's how I've learned to, to do all this stuff. Uh, this is the same QR code if you haven't used it yet, but it, I've created a page that's special for you. It's got the PDF of this presentation. The survey link is there as well. There's a link to a series of articles about how to define your product strategy. It's all just sitting there waiting for you now. Um, so go. So now I truly say uh, thank you from a, a, a scene from dark for all my European friends out there today. Uh, and with that, um, I, I say thank you and, and goodbye. Thanks a ton, Product School, for having me. And uh, enjoy your jobs, product leaders all over the world, because I think it's great fun. Thank you so much. Goodbye. Thank you, Gibson. That was a wonderful talk. Uh, Gip has been part of ProductCon now for a few years. And